Hello everybody, we are having a conversation today with Shoiri Minasha. This is a replay of the conversation we had with her two weeks ago, which unfortunately wasn't recorded. Um, so we're going to have her showing in a minute. She graciously agreed to record it again, so we would have our conversation in the archives. And thank you so much, Shoiri, for doing that. Um, I am adding here uh, uh, the test user. We wanted to be sure that everybody had access to this conversation for the future. We are trying to build an archive uh, that is only getting in touch with all these wonderful artists in this series in the studio. So we're very happy that she agreed. Um, Hi. Hello, Shoji. Hey, I'm. Can you hear me? Hold on. Do you see me? Hold on, I'm going to add you again. Uh, Hello. Can, um, can you hear me? Oh. Can you see me? Yeah, now I see you. Yes. Hi. Awesome. Hi. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Shoei, for doing this again. Yeah, sure. Thanks for to you also. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you for doing this. It's very gracious of you to agree to do this replay of the in the studio talk that we had two weeks ago um almost two weeks ago um mm -hmm. as i was saying before um we want to make sure that we have an archive and that we can have this recorded so that people can see all the beautiful works that you have produced and um, thank you so much for being with us again for this. yeah um, so to start, I would like to let's go to the first images. Uh, something we're commenting. It's an exhibition that you are having right now, mm -hmm. which um, I had the chance to see, and a lot of people has had the chance to see um, in New York um, by appointment, very safely. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, my exhibition is called "I'm Here to Entertain You," but only during my shift. And it's uh, an extension of um, some works that I'll mention in the um, in the presentation today, and um, it's looking at the idea of performativity and how that um, influences ideas we have about identity and, and stereotypes, uh, but also trying to challenge those ideas and um, yeah. So thank you so much. So let's go to the first slide and tell us a little bit about this image. Yeah, uh, we're looking at an image of a work that I did in 2014 called Sivone, which was a um, video performance uh, painting uh, work where I spent about a month or five weeks going to the museum Monday to Saturday as in like a, a regular schedule to paint, uh, hand paint this motif on the wall from a, um, a piece of fabric that I found uh, during my undergrad in school. And um, the motif is this tropical pattern um, that I found and I was trying to understand the ideas that we have about uh, tropicality and the um, black and brown female body within that space. And, and thinking about labor, um, the, the labor that upholds these ideas um, and that upholds this um, system that is very um, intertwined with tourism and, and other uh, ways in which a country like pushes their national identity outside. Mm -hmm. um, and in the video performance, I, after I spend that time, I do another performance where I... Um, pour water on my body and uh, dance to the beat of the song Sivone uh, while uh, smudging my body against the, the wall. And the painting is made of... Um, I'm going to show a little bit of that video, meanwhile. Yeah, yeah. While you tell about it. Yeah, the paint is, is made of uh, tempera, um, I, I mix my own pigments and made my own paints to make it um, 
uh, reversible the the process mm -hmm. so it's not like um so the painting could be turned back into um water soluble again in order to do that performance and the video recording the process of making the painting for that month or five weeks is uh also kind of performative there's moments in which i look at the screen and it has um subtitles that are meant to kind of inform the process of what's going on um and comment on um maybe contextualizing the ideas of, of what i'm doing mm -hmm. and that that will be a bit of the song that is playing now um the song was composed in cuba by Ernesto leporna in 1929 and i was interested in the transformation of the song um, the version that I'm using is Connie Francis's version, which is more centralized and um, she's singing in Spanish but has this accent, has a bit of an English accent. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that to me kind of spoke to the ways in which this type of pattern also is reproduced over and over. And that's an idea that I've um, kept exploring in other works that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you want to talk about the apron? Yeah, the what I'm wearing is like I every time I went into the museum, I'm putting on this um, thing that's kind of like an apron, but kind of like a dress, and that reminded me of the um, of the uniforms that um, several sectors of labor use in in the Dominican Republic from like. Mm -hmm. People who work like domestic labor, uh, people who like take care of your kids or um, uh, clean your house. Mm -hmm. uh, from that to people who clean hotel rooms to people who uh, are, you know, sitting by the beach in this like all inclusive resorts that give in like massage uh, services. Mm -hmm. So there's like all of these different references in, in that kind of white dress slash apron uh, thing. Which is, I mean, like woman labor and, mm -hmm. and its relation to exoticism is something that appears in a lot of your work. This is something yeah. we've been seeing in many works that we're going to be commenting on. Um, but I mean, also the idea of the pattern and this idea of the tropical pattern in particular is something that you've been exploring in different works. And another piece in that tone is this one, right? Yeah. Um, this is La Dorada or uh, slash ridicule number two um it's a the second iteration of a series of uh, wallpapers that i've designed where i'm appropriating an existing wallpaper mm -hmm. so the the first really code was um an appropriation of the pattern design that was made for the beverly hills hotel in 1942 uh and, and there I was interested in, it's like this very green and lush wallpaper. And I was interested in, in how um, the idea of tro tropical space was uh, constructed as this place of leisure uh, during that time, where there was at the same time a lot of um, invasions in tropical spaces and military intervention. So like that uh, contradiction. And for this iteration, um, I'm using a pattern from Zuber, which is a, a French company that um, makes this really like um, detailed, um, crafty, beautiful, um, expensive wallpapers since the 17 or 1800s. And this um, is the original. That's the original. And in the original, which is called El Dorado, um, the they're representing four continents um europe asia um africa and the americas mm -hmm. and i was interested in how um well first of all like the the big amount of detail and like the the big attention to detail that they had um to the point where like if you read um um you know like sales text text that is trying to sell you this wallpaper um they're talking about um imagine sitting in your living room and giving like a geography class to your kid where you can um identify the plants and talk about you know the plants that are in this remote location and and the type of people 
that inhabit it. This one doesn't have any people inhabiting the space, which is another conversation, but they have other wallpapers where they have like uh, people from the Pacific, people from like the uh, Central America, indigenous people. So it, um, they, they advertise it as, as something like that. And, and I was interested in, in that in relation to this history of botanical illustration, um, which is also very concerned with precision and being able to identify um, specimens from these drawings and, and how that relates to ideas of control and knowledge. Um, because, you know, like if you... Um, Botanical illustrations were at the time, like, you know, four or five centuries ago, the, um, a tool for assessing newfound resources um, that were later, you know, capitalized and exploited because of the knowledge of, of, you know, those scientific knowledge that they gathered. So I'm interested in, in that aspect of the wallpaper and in um, um, kind of subverting that aspect of the wallpaper and also in the... Um, what's going on in the different um, layers inside the wallpaper in, in terms of um, perspective, like what is behind and what is in the front. So in, in some areas, what you see, well, basically in all of the continents except for Europe, what you see is um, a lot of like wilderness, I mean, beautifully organized, but um, plants and, and foliage. And, um, and then later on, like behind everything in the distance, you see a little building um, in some sort of architecture that would let you um, uh, associate that with that particular continent. And then in Europe, you have, like, in the forefront, in the first space, you have um, uh, stairs that yeah. lead you to this kind of, like... Um, Which you see here, right? On yes. Mm -hmm. Lead you to, like, this, uh, I don't know, elevated um, structure to to see everything else. So mm -hmm. it, it gives you the idea that if you were to enter this wallpaper, Europe is the only one that you can enter without having to, you know, uh, get some machete and like cut up a lot of weeds or whatever to go then into whatever um, civilized building that is back there in the, in the background. So all of these things are subverted um, in the wallpaper through um, the use of pixelation. So I'm pixelating the, the wallpaper in different layers. It's like different degrees of pixels um, and making it kind of uh, blurry and undetermined and kind of abstracting the different areas of the wallpaper to like squares of color. Um, and I'm interested in, in pixelation in that wallpaper and in the pre preceding one um, because of... Um, ideas about visibility, those ideas that I mentioned about visibility and control and um, detailed and, and what is, you know, totally. what. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, some QR codes that are um, hidden within the pixels that when you scan them, I don't think we have an image there, but when you scan them uh, with your phone, it would lead you to a number of different um, uh, links that um, also add information to, to the wallpaper. And I think um, there's a variety of links depending on like which continent it is and, and next to what type of you know, structure or plant or whatever, there's um, different links that um, like, I think I was looking at um, ideas of exploration and like who has access to, to this uh, narrative of exploration. Mm -hmm. So I was highlighting female and um, people of color, um, explorers of color, uh, historically, mm -hmm. uh, in some of the links. In some of the links, um, I'm talking about, probably there, there must be a link that um, talks about Suber and the history of the original wallpaper. Um, I think there is a link that... Um, uh, oh, I, I'm mixing it up with my other wallpaper because the other one also has links. And um, the preceding one has links for like Banana Republic, both the, the store and the political concept. Um, and um, 
I don't know, also thinking about activists. And I think Berta Cáceres is one of the links in, in the preceding wallpaper. Uh, she was a Colombian um, activist that was murdered a few years ago. Uh, activist for, like, um, Medio Ambiente, how do you say it in English again? Um, uh, the environment and um, communities owning the, the land where they live in. But I think that's not in this one. It's a different narrative here. Let me show, I was thinking one comment that I wanted to bring up, which we brought up in the original talk is, you know, yeah. an institutional uh, link, I mean, it's a coincidence, which is that we at the American Society, we have a mural by Suter, um, which is the, you know, is the Incas room, I mean, the pigs. Um, idyllic uh, encounter between Pizarro and Atahualpa and in Incas. So it's very much in line with the type of depictions that you suggested and this mm -hmm. narrative of like uh, using botanics and decoration to also talk about a fantasy of peaceful encounters that um, is not the way that, you know, the, the, the conquest took place. Mm -hmm. um, but let's also, I want to make sure we have time to also talk about the other projects. And this is an important detail. Um, mm, yeah, you can see there the different um, pixels. Yes, and I think it's very interesting also because by pixelating it, I mean, from a formal point of view, you're also emphasizing how these flowers um, are identified and they have like information that was trying to be conferred to the person. Um, but also, I mean, it's unified and it's kind of like blurry. The information provided there is not truly trying to provoke a thought, but in a way, um, like create a stable narrative, a unified narrative. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. And a wonderful piece that we comment on is this one um, at the Socrates Super Party. Yeah, that um, is an installation that I did in 2018. Um, in 2019, it was installed in 2000. Uh, September 2018 until March or May 2019. And um, it's called Tropticon. It's an installation where I am appropriating a, um, a commercial greenhouse kit that you can buy and like put on your backyard. Yes. Um, and I took photos at the New York Botanical Garden um, in the Bronx at the greenhouses that they have there from the outside of the greenhouse looking in. And, um, and then those are the photos that I use to, to pixelate and, and to cover this greenhouse. And it's, um, the ideas about pixelation and representation of uh, plants are also in conversation with uh, what we were talking about earlier for the really cool patterns um, series. But the difference with this um, installation is that they are printed on, the pixelated images are printed on um, perforated vinyl, which uh, creates this one-way visibility um, situation where like when you look at it from the outside in, it's opaque and you can see the pixels in the image. And then when you look at it from the inside, to the outside, um, it's transparent, and you can look at the environment that is that surrounds you. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested in in this duality, thinking about um, a variety of, of things that I was uh, reading and interested in, but uh, especially um, Foucault's uh, Panopticon. So Tropticon is like a play with uh, of words uh, trying to um, bring up that association in which um, there is it's uh, it's a, a concept that has to do with like um, surveillance and um, control where like there's a person in uh, the center of a space hidden or like unseen from the outside but that person can see everything outside um, mm -hmm. he talks about it in, in the context of prison but um, I think it's applicable to other, um, you know, um, areas. And then, well, and I um, think that it makes sense because you are, you know, building a greenhouse. And I mean, what you're, you know, you're taking this by rhetoric and these histories of uh, uh, structures of control, like Foucault, you know, very clearly, you know, left, you know, mm -hmm. 
or culture, but applying it to your specific study about this idea of botanics and tropicalia as a way to, you know, control the cultural discourse around uh, certain areas of the world that had been dominated by colonialist powers. Mm -hmm. so it makes yeah. Sense. And it's also like a very stunning piece. I mean, I can imagine, I mean, this picture of mm -hmm. like, you know, the, this tropical like garden in the middle of like the snow was really stunning. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've been super interested in, in the juxtaposition of green space, uh, greenhouses in the snow. Um, it brings up like so many ideas and, and thoughts. And um, another thing about this piece is that I wanted to um, maybe frustrate that desire of uh, expecting something exotic inside. So like yes. if you have a greenhouse in the global north, it will usually be housing uh, plants that don't belong to the global north climate. So um, you would expect it to have this like lush, like, you know, exotic, bunch of plants inside and then when you enter this it's um empty and then when you're inside what it offers you instead is the site-specific landscape so mm -hmm. um also that's something that is part of the my interest in that piece mm -hmm. okay so let's come in now on this work in which you go more specifically about women again mm -hmm. yeah so that's um hashtag dominican women google search and um it's uh, it's an installation that I made um, uh, maybe like a year or two after I did Sivone, in which I had been living in the States for a couple of years. And um, it had been, I had noticed that when um, my identity as Dominican was something discussed or that came up, uh, sometimes there was like, some very subtle ideas or questions or expectations of uh, some sort of performativity or something in relation to that identity. And, and I was just curious about like, how are these ideas formulated and how are they, um, uh, you know, how they circulate, how are they propagated? So I um, just casually did a Google search for Dominican women. And when I found the images that came back, um, on the image uh, search, uh, they were very monotonous and um, yeah, they were very monotonous and it was mostly women um, posing for the camera in kind of sensual poses against a backdrop of um, sometimes urban spaces, but mostly tropical spaces, uh, tropical landscape. And um, so yeah, I became curious about like how, uh, yeah, like about this monotony and I started kind of just holding on to the images that I found, copying them on my computer and like classifying them and seeing different things about them. And I started making collages where I was cutting the different body parts um, mm -hmm. of, the, of the women in the images and um, combining them in different ways. And from those two dimensional collages, there's like two different bodies of, bodies of work that came out. One of them is this one, uh, where I, instead of having like a predetermined collage where I'm like putting one part next to another one, I'm printing the, the individual parts. Um, and I blew them up to human scale. So like a face is the size of a face and an arm is the size of an arm. Um, and... And then I hung them in space from one point so that they would be constantly turning around and uh, constantly recombining them. They're also hung to the height of uh, the human body. So a face is like hung uh, approximately mm -hmm. to like, you know, approximate height of a person and like an arm would be where an arm would be. So uh, as they recombine, they're also doing all of these different bodies as you turn around the installation. Mm -hmm. um, as you go into the installation, some, some versions of the installation allow space for people to kind of go into them. Some versions don't because it uh, um, adapts to different spaces. Mm -hmm. and, and then the backside of the print of the image that I found on Google um, on the sculptural um, version of this is covered with, um, oh, actually, I'm, I'm in my studio. I have some pieces here. Right. Um, Great. Yeah. 
Uh, so the backside of them is covered with, uh, let me see, there's like a good piece. Yeah, here's a good piece. So it's like pixelated. Some of them have the watermarks um, of the size when I found them. This is like a leg with a feed. <laughs> and then the back side is covered with um, pieces of fabric that mm -hmm. I um, found on thrift stores. Um, usually from tropical shirts from men. Um, and I wanted them to have that association thinking about the, the gaze and the consumer of this type of imagery. So bringing the body of the consumer also into the um, installation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And then these are some of the postcards. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I didn't say that earlier, but the collages that I did before arriving to the installation version of this um, work um, were two-dimensional and were digital in my computer, and I ended up printing them as postcards. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I started seeing the associations between the, the ways that postcards uh, represented women in landscape to advertise a country, and... Um, the way in which these images, the digital images that uh, lived online, um, also emulated that same formula. So um, I printed them as postcards, and as I traveled back to the Dominican Republic, or if I was invited to do a project in like Puerto Rico or the Bahamas or other Caribbean uh, places, I would leave my postcards in gift shops and take a photo with my phone and leave um, and not tell anyone. So kind of... Um, Kind of excited about the uh, the, pro the possibilities of like you know someone encountering this and maybe buying it as if it was a real postcard or or being kind of uh, puzzled by this strange collage or something like that. But kind of um, contextualizing them in that space and and commenting on that context as well. Like the work that Silvio Mairelias did in the 1960s and 70s, in which all insertions in ideological circuits, in which he would like send political messages on stamps, Coca Cola bottles that would be returned, and on not on stamps, on bills, right? Uh -huh. This idea of inserting something into, you know, an ideological circuit, like, like political. Yeah. Messages. That's awesome. I don't know that piece, but I'll look it up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. You're going to love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, that whole generation of Brazilian artists also worked a lot with postcards, including uh, Alicia Pape, but also ah. Bela Geiger, like intermediate postcards that they would put into circulation also. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know their work, but not their postcard work. Yeah. Cool. Um, but, I mean, it's something very interesting, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's also interesting that postcards are, like, kind of dated at this point. I feel like they've yeah. been re... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what's the word? Uh, well, now you have Instagram and, and like yeah. more digital means to like, you know, uh, taking a photo and sharing it with people and, and things like that. So it's interesting to still go to these gift shops and buy these postcards. Because even when I was buying them, they were already dated. You could see that there was a production not from the time where I was buying, not from the 2000s. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Um... Okay, so now to this series. Yeah, so that's uh, containers, and, and that's the second uh, body of work that kind of came out of this exploration of collages with the Dominican Women Google search and the postcards. So um, from the Google search, I started noticing some poses that repeated, and I started classifying them and seeing which ones repeated the most. And uh, from, from the postcards, that, uh, sorry, from the images, the poses, that repeated the most in the Google search. Uh, I started making, I wanted to, there were some postcards where I was um, covering the body of the woman uh, with um, pattern design that was um, in conversation with the landscape behind her. So um, there's like this one postcard where like, it's like a blue background in the beach and then the pattern is like this uh, blue beachy pattern design. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about ideas of camouflage, but in an ironic and like totally non-functional way. And from those two-dimensional postcards, I wanted to make them three-dimensional. And I started um, sewing bodysuits 
in a shape where when I would wear them, the bodysuit would force me to embody this like uh, posture. Mm -hmm. um, say, say that again. These positions, these standard ideas yes. mm -hmm. that you find on the images. Yeah. And then playing again with, with that idea of like that uh, failed camouflage um, in, the, in the images as well. Um, and I ended up taking photos of uh, spaces that were, that seem natural, not all of them, but they have some degrees of like seeming natural. This one is, for example, one of the most constructed spaces that is obviously constructed and you would never think it's natural. But the previous one um, could be like, you know, in the wilderness type of thing. But this is really the National Botanical Garden in Santo Domingo. And in the photo, maybe not here, but you can see in the photo when it's bigger, some of the concrete floor coming through the leaves. So I'm interested in, in these spaces that um, have this conversation about also nature, but that are man-made and constructed. So this one is like a concrete floor that leads water from one area to another area. And the plants mm -hmm. are on planters. Uh, but it looks like this like beautiful space. This one is the National, um, New York Botanical Garden here. And it's another one of, that is like obviously constructed. Mm -hmm. um, and I keep going back to greenhouses. So this was taken at a greenhouse. Um, and yeah, so that idea of like the construction of the space, um, the construction of landscape, which is also like, you know, you frame it, you take an image or you make a, a landscape painting and um, how land or like a view becomes landscape in the way that we understand it. Um, and um, that construction and then in, in relation to the construction of this pose that is um, also something that is like circulating from before that we then perform or that, you know, exists in, I don't know, the uh, something that you've seen earlier that you then um, perform again. Um, Mm -hmm. And also in relation to the the patterns that I'm I'm using in the um, in the body suits, so are quite amazing. This is we're talking about this as the mermaid pose, yeah. which in a lot of images. But let me show very quickly a little bit of the performance, which I think is very interesting. Mm. Right. Yeah. So I, I started making the photos as like a you know, like as a photographical exploration, photographical, is that a word? I don't know, but, um, mm -hmm. but interested in things like composition and um, maybe art history. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, later I used the, the body suits in a performance where I invited um, four or five different women um, in that occasion, Dominican, although if I do it again, I might expand that to other identities, but, um, Dominican women uh, to perform inside these bodysuits and the logic of the performance, there's one moment where you see people, uh, where, where you see the performer take off the bodysuit um, because the logic of the performance is that there is a, I wrote some scripts and I used some text um, from things that I was reading and I recorded this uh, scripts that I wrote um, and made an audio track. And the audio track is looping. There's like small concealed speakers within the bodysuits um, of each performer that loops the audio. And then between each loop, there's also a gap of silence. And um, during the gaps of silence, they, they have the liberty of um, taking the bodysuit off and um, talking to people and um, taking a break. But when it's playing the audio, the voice, to be in the body out of these body suits um, and constantly holding these poses for like a number of minutes and then taking a break. So, um, and then the performance lasts for two hours. So it's uh, kind of, um, again, going back to those ideas, uh, maybe from Sivone where I was thinking about labor and shift. And um, in fact, the, the exhibition that is up right now at uh, Baxter Street Camera Club until September 30th, is uh, named after uh, one phrase from one of the scripts for this performance, which is, I'm here to entertain you, but only during my shift. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let me go back to the images. Yes, it's a super stunning image because, I mean, the suits are very uncomfortable also, but when you see the performers, like, taking out, you know, and and it's very interesting, you know, that this rigidity of, like, the standardized posing, you know, of mm -hmm. the posing is something that you explored also with regard to monuments. Um, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, after I did that work, I um, I had a, a couple conversations and um, especially one studio visit with uh, curator Nomaduma Masilela, mm -hmm. um, where we were talking about these bodies of women that I have been covering and like how to expand that to, you know, um, what about the patriarchy and like what could be symbols and, and things that, that could be a gesture to expand to. And um, I was invited to the Bahamas to do a two-person two show um, in 2017 uh, for a program that was curated by Holly Bino and Amanda Colson. Uh, called Double Dutch, where they pair uh, a Caribbean diaspora artist with a local Bahamian artist. So I had an exhibition with Dee Dee Brown, and when we were developing the ideas of the exhibitions, these, these of the exhibition, these ideas of um, insider outsider um, uh, came up a lot. And I have been editing a video, which I don't know if we have time to see or if it's in the presentation. I can't remember if it's in, it's in the presentation, but I have been editing a video called Labadee that is about a cruise ship, um, a trip on a cruise ship that was going to Haiti and into a particular beach that is very uh, secluded. Like it's, you can normally on the cruise ships, you can like uh, stop and like take a Oh, here's a video. Okay. Uh, normally on the, on the cruise ships, you can, uh, I don't know, take a taxi for a couple hours and go see something and then go back to the ship. But in Labadee, uh, it's fenced off and you can't really go into town. You only spend a day at the beach. And that creates uh, some intense dynamics that are already present in touristic spaces. But um, to me, they like exaggerate them but the video of lava d when there's like moments of the cruise ship at sea um the subtitles are talking about um are appropriate are like excerpts from uh christopher columbus's diary uh when they first see land so i have been interested in in this um for that video specifically linking um, contemporary tourism to um, historical colonialism mm -hmm. and um, thinking about how, you know, routes of these cruise ships today may have been routes that were used for like military invasions or like colonization or like uh, moving slaves between uh, enslaved people between um, different points in the Caribbean. Um, and then um, so when I was invited to the Bahamas to do this exhibition, I had been just, I had just finished editing this video and I wanted it to be part of that exhibition and it was part of the exhibition. Um, it was the, the first time it was shown there. And, and then I realized the exhibition was gonna open on October 12th, which is uh, Columbus Day and now uh, in some places, Indigenous Peoples Day. And, um, and I realized they had this uh, statue of Christopher Columbus mm -hmm. uh, in Nassau, where the exhibition was going to be at. So I, I really wanted to cover this statue, thinking about the conversation that I had with this curator and that I was thinking about how to like, expand this gesture to other applications. And um, so we asked for permissions, but there wasn't enough time to make the permissions. And they also mentioned that the they didn't want to have that conversation. The the you know monuments and and whatever division of the institution that um, governs over these statues. Uh, and I think that what they meant by not wanting to have that conversation or not being ready to have that conversation was that at the time, just like now, there had been a lot of conversations about monuments, and maybe they didn't want to stir that up. Um, but I didn't want to cover it to leave it there. I just wanted to cover it for the photo or originally. And similarly to the, um, to the uh, 
uh, video, Lava D, the intention of covering this had to do with um, making that link between contemporary tourism with this like hyper tropical, um, very colorful uh, pattern that is used in touristic spaces with um, colonial um, mm -hmm. histories, especially because the statues are a stop in tours. Like if you take a tour through Nassau or whatever, like a touristic situation, it will probably stop there and be like, this is the statue of Christopher Columbus in front of the governor's house. Um, but they didn't let me do it, so I did a photo montage. And I printed this as postcards again, which people were invited in the exhibition to um, write their ideas about my proposal. And then <laughs> these are some of the backs of the postcards that... Um, register those those uh, opinions of people um that came through the show so i have like 70 or 80 postcards um with different opinions from um you know people that were very engaged with the idea and being like cover the fuckers and uh uh, why do we have this standing here um, for uh, two people who were very you know um, history is what it is you should let it be um, there was almost no one signed their, their postcards but there was this woman Nancy from the USA who wanted me to know that history is what it is and I should let it be um, so yeah there's all of these different opinions and, and then eventually I did get to cover a statue but not in the Bahamas um, in Miami which is the, the one that we're seeing here um, is Christopher Columbus and another one of Ponce de Leon and because I finally got the permission and also thinking about um, how to push the, the project uh, further instead of using uh, pattern design that already exists, which is what, I, what I've been doing in most of my practice, appropriating this production to comment on the idea that this is such a prolific production to begin with, um, and how this, is, this type of patterns are so, um, um, yeah, kind of like superficially thought of as like yeah. innocuous and uh, not very meaningful necessarily, but how they are directly tied to all of these um, histories and stereotypes. And anyways, for this occasion, instead of using something that already existed, I decided to design my own patterns based on uh, some research that I did. So um, I uh, learned that Ponce de Leon died because of an arrow that struck him that was poisoned with manchinel. And Manchinel is the plant that is then represented in the pattern that um, is covering the statue of Ponce de Leon. Mm -hmm. And um, it was used by the Calusa uh, natives of South mm -hmm. Florida uh, commonly to poison their arrows. And, and to me, that was like such a, um, it, it was kind of like uh, mind blowing that I didn't know this story until I researched because um, it was like such a strong symbol of, of resistance and like such an amazing, you know, historical fact. And so I wanted to highlight that through the pattern of Ponce. And then the pattern for um, Columbus was um, with uh, highlighting the, the plant. I mean, it has different plants. It has um, castor plant, um, Rompe Saraguay. I don't know the name of it in English, and uh, Yopon Holly. And they each have like different um, degrees of uses for uh, resistance. So Yopon Holly was like a, a plant that was used in uh, rituals before taking um, uh, important decisions by a variety of Native Americans uh, in South Florida and also in other states. And um, also for purging, so it was, it was a plant that will make you uh, vomit and like get into the states that had to do with purging, but also linked to important decisions. And then the um, castor plant, which is the most prominent plant in the, in the wallpaper, um, was a plant that was brought from Africa to the Americas through the transatlantic slave uh, system. And um, it was, it has healing properties and it's used like um, for a lot of, you probably heard of castor oil, a lot of people use it for like their hair, their skin, but also they're used for remedies. Um, 
uh, and it was used in like a colonial context by enslaved people to heal themselves because no one was going to heal you there uh, if you were, you know, replaceable. And if you died, they would just bring another person to do your job. So um, that knowledge was super important. Um, but castor plant also has ricin, which is one of the most um, potent toxins. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was fascinated by how, you know, the knowledge of how to handle this plant uh, came from came through the same system that uh, meant so much oppression. But also, castor plant is used in um, uh, castor plant from Pesaragüey, Yapan Holly. They're all um, linked to different like systems of beliefs that um, use them for cleansing and purging um, in like a spiritual sense. So I was also interested in in bringing that idea. Um, forward in in that statue of you know mm -hmm. the idea of like purging the statue getting rid of the statue riddance in no, relation so to the statue covered, uh, right like um, say that again and it's covering it right it's kind it's of covering it yeah. it yeah 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 and in fact i just read this morning actually in the news that um someone sent recent to the white house like an envelope with recent i was like oh look at that <laughs> is that right uh, pretty crazy um but yeah it's a very strong um toxin and and i was just fascinated by how this is such a used thing like castor oil is like super um uh, popular and um yeah and this is all um influenced by a lot of like recent ethnobotanical um uh, research that I've done that have been uh, facilitated by um, a number of resources, but I wanted to highlight Ina van der Broek, who is uh, an ethnobotanical uh, ethnobotanist from the New York Botanical Garden. Um, mm -hmm. That has been like super helpful in like having conversations to identify these things. Totally, totally. Yeah. I was seeing. I think we saw all the videos. I wanted to make sure. Yes. Um, and we do have a few more images of uh, 11D, but we already kind of commented. Yeah, I kind of like jumped <laughs> through a few things. Um, no, 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 but that's okay. I think it's, it's so amazing because this work, I mean, it's just to, to, you know, give some closure to all the different elements. I mean, you started your research, you know, you start with the idea of the pattern, you know, and the botanical pattern, and you keep working with it through the years until you only recently, in a way, there to make your own pattern. And at the mm -hmm. time of taking it, you're doing the same thing that, you know, these explorers and botanists were doing, which is to use certain knowledges for symbolic power, right? Mm -hmm. like subverting, you know, the political positioning of that, mm -hmm. by, you know, using it on the styles on the monuments and kind of like questioning it. And I think it's so interesting that your work at the, at, at the same time, ever since the beginning, since this work, you know, is talking about, you know, the hidden information in these patterns, not only in terms of what kind of plant it's using, but also in terms of the labor behind it, mm -hmm. you know, and the knowledge behind it, the knowledge of the, uh, you know, blue collar worker that is painting, you know, as we saw in the performance, it's a very specific process to paint these murals. Um, but also, you know, the appropriated knowledge of indigenous cultures, you know, that would use, for example, rising, you know, for, you know, for as poison. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very interesting how, you know, we see a very, you know, solid narrative that goes through the work, but that at the same time evolves in a very organic way. Uh, and that is not trying to set any closed message, right? It's just making questions and opening possibilities to see in a different way, again, to see, you know, from a new perspective. So I thought that was, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also something I, now that you're talking about visibility, um, something that I forgot to mention, especially for containers, but I think it's also present in like a variety of my words is, um, I'm very interested in, in the idea of, um, Edouard Glissant when he talks about opacity in, in his book, Poetics of Relation. Um, he, he's talking about this idea of opacity as like, a a, well, he, he calls it a right he, that he demands that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but he talks about it generally as like um, uh, 
a tool or like a space for um, maybe or the way that I interpret it, um, uh, have a, a respite from from this demands of legibility and visibility and hyper visibility as an other or as a person um, that is othered by the normative. So um, he talks about, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of like a specific quote, but um, actually I have the book right here since I'm in my yeah. studio. <laughs> I love it. We should close with this. Listen. Say that again. Yeah. Let's see. Sure, it's like crazily underlined. Yes. No, it's like underlined all over, so I can't find the chapter on a passage. Oh, that, uh, okay, got it, got it, got it. I'm going to go through some images. I mean, yeah. even in this work, I mean, it's very clear how the opacity really makes you see the body, right? I mean, it's precisely because it's covered that we see. Yeah, he says, it is that which cannot be reduced, which is the most perennial guarantee of participation and confluence. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as far as my identity is concerned, I will take care of it myself. That is, I shall not allow it to become cornered in any essence. I shall also pay attention to not mixing it into any amalgam. Rather, it does not disturb me to accept that there are places where my identity is obscured to me, and the fact that it amazes me does not mean I relinquish it. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of underlined stuff in this um, um, essay for me, but um, in general, it's something that also like translating those, you know, theoretical, theoretical ideas of opacity in relation to identity to then like a visual realm of like the visual arts. Mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting, I'm sure. I mean, I think also it's it's a concept that a lot of people are interested in in the visual arts, and I think it it has to do with that idea of playing around with visual. So, like you know, mm -hmm. like in Tropicon, when something is opaque and transparent at the same time, um, and then the the different ways that you can activate that in relation to different conversations. Um, but then also in in the containers where like this person is covered in this body. So that then also is forcing you to um, enact a particular position. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the performance version of that, where they are taking it on and off, and then you can, you get like a reveal of the person underneath. Um, and then also opacity in relation to ideas of camouflage. So maybe if we have like a couple extra minutes, I can read... Um, read some of the mm -hmm. the video normally the the video that documents the performance normally has um audio that is the audio that you hear in the performance but because i was talking you didn't hear that so i can read some of the excerpts from from that especially um mm -hmm. the one about camouflage so um camouflage or how to lose your native accent in five quick steps Blending with your surroundings. Whenever you forget, there will be someone there to remind you, diligently pointing out your difference. You can pretend to blend in with the urban landscape you're walking in to not be noticeable among the chaos and the movement and the sirens and the lights, to be just one more in the swarm of people, to be invisible and just go about your business. You can pretend to think about all sorts of universal things, but a stare, a tone, a question about your provenance, or a damn will bring you back to your brown female perceivably, perceivably foreign body. Mm -hmm. Having the mental space to fantasize about gardens and hikes and the universe is a privilege. And then another one um, says, it's called compliment, complete not compliment. I'm not Lilith, I'm not Eve, I'm not a flower. In many plants, what most people would call the flower is actually a group of colorful specialized leaved, leaves called Brags. Hello. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had a call. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, the true flowers are hidden inside these hard, protective bracts and are fairly insignificant. I'm not the motherland. I'm not the landscape. I'm not in the landscape. I'm framing this composition. I'm not a flower. I'm only here to work. I'm here to entertain you, but only during my shift. Um, so, yeah, wonderful. this... That is sorry. wonderful. No, I think that oh, it, was, it was wonderful to hear the sentences as well, while well, seeing the images of your work. Um, Mm, so thank you so much, Roy, for doing this again with us. It's been really amazing, and I'm glad. I mean, we keep discovering things, and and thank you so much. And can you repeat for people when they can see your show until September 30? You want to give the information? Yeah, sure. So um, I have uh, the my solo show is up at Baxter Street Camera Club until September 30th. Um, it's called I'm Here to Entertain You, but only during my shift. As you heard, is an excerpt from one of the performances. And um, it's uh, you can go see it by appointment uh, from Tuesday to Saturdays between noon and six. But I'm going to be there for the whole day on September 24th, September 25th, September 29th, and September 30th. And that's a little more flexible. You can kind of come in because I'm there. Uh, but it will be nice if you still let me know if you want to come, just so we have um, a sense of the number of people who are in the space. So we keep it under the maximum for COVID reasons. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Odi. And everybody, please go see it. It's really a wonderful show, and she's a great tour guide. Uh, I mean, it's great to be able to see art again. And thank you so much for joining us and for participating in the series. Yeah, sure. Thanks for inviting me. It was great to do it again. Uh, right. yeah. I think everything was so much more clear to me. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> talking about the yeah. word. Yeah. For me. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye.